Hi, NCC family. I just want to thank you all so much for all your generosity this past year. Rahab's is thriving. We're doing wonderful here. We have uh, 16 residents, two house moms, 14 live-in children, and we have 10 more ladies getting ready to come in January. Um, we have praise and worship every single morning from 8.30 to 9.30. We also have a kids' world where the toddlers get to go in and do praise and worship, learn about Jesus, and just learn life itself. And then um, something else is huge is we've been donated a ski trip. Woohoo! We're all excited. The ladies are really excited. So that's even a victory for us this year to take the ladies on something like that. Another thing is we have eight ladies that have finished a semester of college, the fall semester, and they're getting ready to start back in January. To us, that's a huge victory. We could not do this without every single one of you. Thank you very much for all your help. We love y'all. Thank you. Amen. That's awesome, isn't it? Well, good morning, New Covenant. Welcome everybody watching us online as well, and that uh, little testimonial, that's Rahab's Retreat. If you don't know who they are, they are a ministry uh, home for girls uh, just down the road in Kilgore, tremendous ministry our, our church partners with, I mean, even attend our church. Uh, these ladies have come out of uh, many of them the sex industry and other troubled backgrounds, and they're seeing tremendous turnaround. Most of them come on the first service, and they just really... You just see their faces, and you can see the glory of God. It's really exciting, and our church is a big part of that. So they just wanted to give you guys a big thank you. Uh, many people partner with them, but we play a, 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 a significant role as well. So praise God for that. So if you have your Bibles, if you will turn to Matthew 5. I want to go into where we started last week. Matthew 5, we're in a series that deals with this subject that I am absolutely in love with. And that is light, the issue of light, light of the world. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. But then we saw last week here in Matthew, we're going to read it again. He says, you're the light of the world. Let's start in Matthew 5, verse 14. He said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set up on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. How many know that's a commandment? Let your light shine before men. So we've been looking at how do we do that. And we saw that last week Jesus divided this issue of light into two categories. There's, there's a category called the city, which is the lights gathered together. And that's the corporate light, the corporate witness, if you will. And that's, that's the church. I believe that's the church. And we saw that that... We are challenged as a church, we have a divine responsibility to, to be on the hill, to be as bright as possible, to, be as in, in, to give as much light as we can. And we're, we're, really, we're really motivated by that. We're driven by that, if you will. How can we get more light to more people, to be as visible as we can? And we believe, as I shared with you last week, that God has given us a way to do that in the coming year. In the coming years, if you will, uh, we found uh, a second location that allows us to not only grow seat-wise, we can add more seats, but we can also be more visible and more available to people. And this is in North Longview. It's at the loop, at the corner of the loop and Judson Road. It's, we always say it's, behind, it's a shopping center behind um, Olive Garden. That's the easy reference point. Everybody knows where Olive Garden is. And so we have procured... a. Uh, a second location, we will have live worship in both places, live preaching in one place and stream to the other, and then we'll go back and forth. Everything else will be the same, and it's right there on the loop, and uh, we have also, we are ordering a sign, it's one of the bigger signs in Longview, I think we've got a potential mock-up there of it, New Covenant Church, North Campus, and so it will be easier for people to find both campuses, I believe. Now, one of the things we need to know it would be helpful, we have three services on Sunday morning, and we'll go back to two in one location. Ultimately, we believe we'll have two in two locations, but we're going to start with two services in one location and a, one service in the other location. What we have to figure out is which one is which. What you can do is help us. 
And we have a little survey cards. If you have one in the seat pocket in front of you or near you, or you can do this online, you can go to YouVersion, the YouVersion app. Some of you follow the notes on the YouVersion Bible app. There's a place for you to take that survey. You can go on our website and take this survey. Simple question, uh, how many are in your family and which campus do you think you would start attending? Which one is be closer probably to you? Like I said, it's at the loop, North Loop and Judson Road. It's the busiest intersection in Longview. So we are excited about the hill God's given us Amen. to get out the light more. So uh, this doesn't commit you to anything, but it helps us plan. We're thinking our target, aggressive target, is late at the end of January. So that's what we hope we can be ready for. We're doing some, some remodeling and, 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 and facelifting inside to make it really nice. Both campuses will be exciting. Both campuses will be alive with Jesus. It's just more of the same. So you, quality is not going to change. Whichever is probably most convenient. is uh, We'll have great children's ministry in both places. So if you would take a minute. Again, this isn't a commitment. There's no name here. It's just numbers. Numbers of people where you live. If you could take a minute either today or online or soon and fill this out. And then you can drop it on the in our, We have these boxes on the way out. And just drop it in, please. And only do this once. <laughs> Don't change your mind and go, I think I'll do this. <laughs> That'll mess us up, okay? So that helps us. All right, so that's the city. The city's the church, amen? amen. We're the city, right? Amen. The city, we say, God, put us on a hill. Let our light be as bright as we can to, this, to the city. Our city goes to this city, to this area called East Texas. But then there's the other thing he said, and that is a lamp stand. A lamp cannot be, you don't hide a lamp under a, a, a basket, but you put it up on a lampstand, and that is your witness, your personal witness, your light. I want to talk about your light. Last week I talked about our light, but now I want to talk about your light, my light, our individual light, our individual witness. What is Jesus teaching us here? And I believe this passage deals with four different things we need to be aware of, okay, in this section. I want to give you four things out of this passage that I think Jesus wants us to know. The first one is this. He wants you on a lampstand. God wants you on a lampstand. Do you know that? People say, well, I don't want anybody looking at me. God says, I want people to look at me. Have you figured that out yet? God wants you displayed prominently. By the way, those are the right reasons to succeed in life. Those are the right reasons for accomplishments or success, or to be enriched in resources, or anything else. Why? So that you can let light shine out of your life in a better way. Now, <clears throat> many times people get nervous about this, you know. Uh, they take unbiblical positions, and they call it humility. They say, well, I don't want anybody looking at me. And Paul said, I want you to imitate me as I imitate Christ. Peter was walking into the temple with John in the hour of prayer in Acts 3, and there was a beggar looking for money, and he said, look upon us, look upon us, and he said, rise and walk. See, for God to see, for others to see God, they first have to see God's people. That's why he said, you're the light. We have a city, but a lot of people will never make it to the city until they get close to a lamp. The individual lamp they see the light in you, and they say, I want to come to your city. And I hope you're inviting people to your city. I invite people to, our, to my city all the time. I want you, do you have a great church to go to? I want you to see the lights. You know, this is Christmas, right? So we have all these display of lights and long lines of cars just so we can see a bunch of lights. Amen? And, and we're living in a dark place in, in history. And there are people who are hurting and they're stumbling. We saw last week that it, Jesus said, if, you don't, if you're walking in darkness, the definition of darkness is you don't know where you're going. And you run into things and you hurt yourself. And you're not excited about the future because you cannot really see where you're going. So God wants you on a light. In the ancient times, they, the lamps, one commentary I read says these lamps were not very bright. So that in order for the lamps to light up the house, which is usually dark, and they didn't have much windows back in those homes, 
uh, he said they had to put it up on a lampstand. God wants you displayed prominent. I want you to think about this for a minute. Don't think about yourself right now. Think about the people in your world that you think may be in darkness. They're not following Jesus. They don't go to church anywhere. They don't you never you don't have any indication that they know how to do life God's way. That they have his life inside of them. They're in darkness. I want you to think for just a minute about them. Because that's how you become a light. When you look at yourself, you can see all kinds of things you don't like. But when you start looking at other people, then you start seeing they need light. And you know what? I can't, I can't know for sure that anyone else is going to be that light to them. You can't assume that. You have to be willing to let God let you be, to have God let you be the light. You have to be willing to be the light. That means you've got to be up on a lampstand. So that's the first thing. He wants you in a prominent place. Whether you want to be there or not, he wants you there. The second thing he tells us in this passage, I believe, is what does it mean to, sh- I want to talk to you about what does it mean to actually shine the light. What is it, how does that work? And I, I believe to shine the light means we're sharing the light. I said last week that he's the sun and we're like the moon, right? The moon, you can't see the sun at night, but you can see the moon. And for many people, it's dark, it's night in their life. This world, we're told, is getting darker. And the sun must get brighter. I mean, the moon must get brighter so they can know there is a sun. There is a light somewhere if they'll go to it. So um, it means we're sharing what we've been given. It's not like we say, I know everything and I got it all together and I'm, I'm your answer person. But you can and should be sharing what you've been given. And the more you've been given, the more you should be sharing. Whether it's insight or wealth or a talent, you know, or energy or insight or revelation. It's not just for you. Someone has well said, God will get to you what he can get through you. So basically, we're just sharing the light that we've been given. It's like we're all walking around in this big, dark cavern. What would you think of somebody? You heard a bunch of noises and people running into things and yelling and hurting and moaning, and you walked in and you had a big, bright lantern and you gave it to somebody. And they were so thankful they could see now. They weren't in the darkness anymore. And you saw them go down the trail. And as they went, they were so now in a hurry. I can see where I'm going, and I'm excited about my future. And they're going forward. And they hear the cries of someone else, but they're just too busy. They're just too busy to go over there and give them a lantern or help them. What would you think about that person? You think, wow, I gave you a light and and you won't share it. See? So so it means that's what it means to shine the light. It means to share the light. Now, what is the light? I believe the light is is in two areas. It is it is it is how to live, very simply, and where life comes from. How to live and where life comes from. Let me explain. Pastor Gary, you heard him get up and share with you. He's our marriage and family pastor. So he spends time with couples. He's good at that. He's gifted in that. He's trained in that. And and, um, he's telling them how life works in marriage. He's given some light. Because, I mean, if you don't know what you're doing in marriage, you're hurting yourself all the time. You know, I, I watch the world. The world has turned away from God. And, and the, you know, these celebrity marriages that can't last more than two years. And, and, and they just stumble. And it's just so hard because they, they don't know what God's Word says about marriage. So that's why we have light about marriage, for instance. And Pastor Gary, he'll give them light. This is what communication looks like. This is what harmony looks like. This is how men and women are made differently. This is how to rep- recognize somebody else's love language. These are... These are keys to making it work a lot better. This is light, so you're not tripping over things. Like I remember one of the biggest light insights I got is when my wife shares a problem with me, I crazily thought she wanted a solution. (laughs) That was a huge insight for me. 
She did not want a solution. I'm a problem solver. It's what I do all day, all day long. People give me a problem, I solve it. So I thought she wanted me to solve her problem. And she wanted just empathy, just support, just, oh, I'm so sorry. Wow, that must have been rough. That doesn't compute for me. But it works for her, right? Need some help. All ladies smiling at me right now. So I'll mess with her now. She'll say, I don't know how to make this email work. And I say, I am so sorry. I know, I'm bad. I'm bad. Bad, 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 bad. Bad, bad husband. <laughs> but Pastor Gary, many times, he'll not just tell them how life is done. He'll tell them where life comes from. And guys, that's really where I mess, what our message is. Because you can have all the right techniques in marriage, but you don't know the author of life. You're going to always be frustrated because you're going to always try to get from that other person what only God can give you. This is what we do. We try to get from our jobs or from our money or from our mates or from our friends or from our, <clears throat> our diversions. We try to get what only God can give us. We try to get that sense of fullness and, 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 and richness of life. But you can, be, you can be poor and alone and not be poor and alone if you have Him. You're wealthy. So, so our light is this. Our light is to say He is your source. That's really our core message. And once you let him become your source, then he'll show you how to do life. So none of us are setting ourselves up as all that or experts. So you don't have to be afraid of get, letting God put you in a prominent place. You should aspire to that, actually. When I started studying this, I got excited because I've never heard anybody say to Christians, you should aspire to be put in a prominent place. That sounds like the opposite of what we've been taught in church. We should all be humble and silent and hidden. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He said, you don't hide a light. He didn't just say, don't hide it. He said, on purpose, put it in a prominent place. I'm going to challenge you to ask God what that means for you this month and the next year. What does it mean, God? What does it mean? Do you want me on a bigger stand, a higher stand? Do you want me in a place where I can shine more light? that I'm able to shine right now. I believe he does. And what, what we're, we're saying, we're saying he's the light. We're saying he's our source. Really, when you shine light, here's what you're doing. You're telling his story. Now, here's what we need to understand. And I think if you think about this, you'll find this works in your life this way. To tell his story, you usually have to tell your story. I, I preach for a living, so I know how to tell his story. But when I talk at a personal level with people, I find I'm telling them my story. As a Christian, not as a pastor, but as a Christian. Two weeks ago, I was, I was with a guy, and I was in, <clears throat> we were talking, and, and uh, he was a nice guy, older guy. He's retired. And I said, he said, I don't go to church. He had a bad experience. He was in what is now recognized as a cult. And it was very controlling, very negative church experience. We've got a lot of people out there that have those kind of experiences. And <clears throat> I said, well, he said, my wife goes, but I don't go. He said, I, I just watch it online. I said, well, online's good. It's better than nothing. But it's not what God has for you. I said, because you're missing God's people and you're missing God's presence. And then I, I'm like, how do I help this guy? And so I told him my story. That's what you do. He said, this, for instance, he said, I was saved in college. And I, the reason how I got right with God is that I went to a meeting. I didn't just study the Bible. You know, I had no interest in studying the Bible. I went to a meeting. I got into a city. I saw people worshiping God, and I felt God's presence. That's my story. I went in there, and I felt God's presence. You know, if you stop and think about your story and how God intersects with your story, you're going to find your a big part of your whole life message. Think about your story for a minute and study it. And in that story is your life message. See, my whole life message is I want to create a place like this for God's presence to prevail so other people can come like me, clueless, wandering around in the dark, you know, highly educated but ignorant, Moving in to nothing, no future, no, nothing to look forward to. 
but materialistic gain. And all of a sudden, I come into the presence of God. Like, oh, my gosh. And the Lord spoke to me in that, in that moment. He said, give your life to me, and you'll have this the rest of your life. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Easy sell. And I've been following him ever since. See, so we, we tell our story so we can tell his story. My question is, are you doing that? Are you telling your story to people? Are you desiring to tell your story to people? Is that something that motivates you? See, the truth is many people are not motivated to tell their story. They think, ah, I got stuff, man. I got stuff that I got to get fixed. I don't, I don't want to tell my story yet. And you think you can just fix it. You think you just keep working on it a little bit longer. And my question is, how's that working out for you? How long has that been going on? How long has that been going on? See, the thing is, if you're not wanting to tell people your story, then the truth is probably you haven't fully invited God into your story. When you fully invite God into your story, you're not worried about the embarrassing ch chapters. The shameful chapters, the chapters where you kept tripping in the dark. You're not embarrassed about that anymore. Teresa, you heard her story. She started Rahab's Retreat. She was in the sex industry. She sold her body for a living, yet she is not ashamed to tell people her story. She has told her story to thousands and thousands of people. She's not ashamed of it anymore because she invited God into it. So you can say, you know, I got this chapter, I got this chapter, I'm not proud of it, but God. When you put God in the story, you're not ashamed to tell people anymore. He knows how to redeem every chapter in your life. So quit trying to fix your chapters. You can't. Only He can. Let Him. Invite Him in. Make Him Lord of your life. And when you do that, you'll be pumped about your story. He fixed it. Oh, my gosh. How did that happen? It's miraculous. God and God alone knows how to fix your story. Amen? Amen. That was very... Very lukewarm, amen. 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 Very tepid. Amen. The third thing get Jesus wants to tell us is good works help you share his story. He talks about good works, not just verbal, but actions, okay? What is good works, okay? Jesus said, they may see your good works. Notice what he says, that they may see, see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, we always think, oh, I'll go give to Salvation Army or Red Cross. That's good. But you know, unbelievers and believers alike do that. And when an unbeliever does it, they don't glorify their Father in heaven because God is not yet their Father in heaven. So I think He's more than just the simplistic good works that we think of when he, we read the word good works. Think with me for a minute. He said, they may see your good works. If they're the right good works, they will glorify your Father in heaven. So whatever our good works are, if they're done right, God will get the glory. Amen? Can we agree on that? So what are those good works that allow us to tell His story, that allow Him to be glorified, that allow us to shine light into people who are stumbling in darkness? The Amplified Version is interesting here. It says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your moral excellence and your praiseworthy, noble, and good deeds and recognize and honor and praise and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So the first good works that I think people need to see is that we live virtuous lives. You know, we, we live... We live, our speech and our, 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 is not perfect, and our, and, and our attitudes are not perfect. You know, somebody asked me once, he said, they said, have you ever lost your temper? And I said, unfortunately, no, I still have it, you know. <laughs> but they, <laughs> but I'm getting better. <laughs> and it's like they see a quality of life, a peace that wasn't there before, a commitment to godliness and purity that we're not ashamed about, that we're not 
so worried about what a decadent world thinks about us anymore. We're not trying to earn the praise of corrupt men and women. But we're living for the praise of God. Again, doesn't mean you're going to be perfect and you're not going to stub your toe occasionally. Because light comes by degrees. But they see something in us, a quality of life. And I want to say to you, I don't care what your past or present is. God has a quality of life for you that's worth having. It's really worth having. It's worth going after. It's available no matter what your circumstances. And, and, and if we press into that, we will find that people will, and this is what God's after. Don't hear me wrong on this. People will want what you have. People will want what you have. They'll want the peace you have. They'll want the marriage you'll have. They'll want just how you live. They'll see something there. They see how your kids act. And they'll want to learn from that. And then you can tell them. And it's not like you're the Dr. Phil of the day. It's just that God has shined light into you. Guys, some of you are struggling with this because you think it's like we're setting ourselves up or you're feeling very awkward. But can, I, can we agree this world needs help? And that means people need help. And who's going to help them? Who's going to help them? Well, everybody goes around, somebody needs to do something. Government's not going to do it. It's not their job. It's our job. It's a church's job. It's a church's job to help people. He's given us answers. And we need to be zealous about helping people. Find ways to help people. Get them into that light so they quit hurting themselves. One of the great ways we can get people to open up to God and His story to them is this thing called generosity. Generosity. Everybody say generosity. It's one of our core values back on the wall. Generosity. Generosity is powerful. It's hard for somebody to have a wall up after you've been generous to them. Toward God or you. God's goodness, the Bible says, leads us to repentance in Romans 2. It leads us to investigate our lives and our relationships with Him. When Jesus was generous to Peter and helped him catch uh, a great load of fish, which for him was his business, his livelihood. He blessed his business. It humbled Peter. It brought him to a new place of humility and repentance because he knew he didn't deserve that level of goodness. The message version of this verse is interesting. He says, keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you will prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. December is a great time to be generous, isn't it? I mean, we're generous anyway to people in our world. But here's, a cha- here's something to think about. Be generous to people that you normally wouldn't be generous to, you know? And if you're telling people about God or they know you're a follower of Jesus, that generosity will mean something. So if you, say, go to a restaurant and you invite the waitress or waiter to your church, then you leave a good tip. By the way, if you invite them to our church, please leave a good tip. (laughs) Just say it. It means something. But if you never... If they never, you never talk about your father and just leave him a good tip, they'll just say, what a great person. So we tell his story, and then we're generous. And that's what I think Jesus is trying to get us to do. They may see your good works, he said. And if they see it, the right, if they see it, they'll glorify your father in heaven. I think one of the ways that our stand can get bigger is through generosity. And then finally... Jesus tells us, and this is not in this passage, but real near it, in the same Beatitudes section, he tells us how to get our light brighter. In Matthew 6, the very next chapter, he says this, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Interesting here. If your eye is bad, he said, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Obviously, this is what we look at, but look at is, I mean, we could say this is media, but not just media. It's really beyond media, because they didn't have media back then. 
It's our focus. In fact, two verses later, he tells us, no one can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one or love the other, or else you will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Did you know that? You can't have two masters. In fact, I'm really, I'm really torn. I'm trying to serve God. I'm trying to serve other people, or I'm trying to serve the world. I'm trying to serve God. It's really hard. He says, you're, you're mistaken. You're not serving both. You can't. It's impossible. You've yet not served God. You're still being pulled, and, the, and, and your focus is not yet on him. He says, you cannot serve God. And he, he didn't say it's hard. He said you just can't. And the, and the word mammon here means, uh, it, it means wealth, but it means wealth as your source. And I have found that it's not, it's not necessarily the wicked things that keep us from God. It's the legitimate pursuits of life. That can keep us from God. So we're, we're scurrying around. I'm just trying to make a living. I'm just trying to pay the mortgage. I'm just trying to get my kids through school. And that's my focus. If that's your focus, you're not going to be full of life. You're not going to be telling people about Him. And the reason you're not is because if you read the, if, go to the end of Matthew 6, and He says very simply, if you will seek first the kingdom of God, I'll take care of this other stuff. Your needs will be met. Go ahead and act like you have a God that meets your needs. I mean, it's a crazy thought. Just go ahead and act like it in case it's true. <laughs> and what happens is you're full of light. You see, if you're, all your energy and all your focus is getting to the end of that cave with the new light you've got, just getting through life, just getting, paying the bills and taking a vacation and having a little, diver, little, little few diversions, a little entertainment, and you're always hoping you can make it or you're going to get what you need out of life, you're not thinking about anybody else, really. But if you act like God's your source, then you're going to have energy and life and love for other people. And you're going to start paying attention to the other people in your world. And you're going to say, I wonder if they know God. I wonder if they know this Jesus. I wonder if they have a church to go to. I wonder if they know how powerful God can be. I wonder if they feel the warmth of his love. I wonder if they have the insights that God has given. I don't have a lot, but I'm so thankful for at least what I've got. I'm not tripping anymore over the things I used to trip over. Then you find that you start becoming, you start fulfilling your mission, basically. You start becoming light. Amen? So, how many of you want to be light? Are you ready to be light? Some of you have already been involved. Some of you are getting there more and more. Jesus, the Bible says one more thing about this focus. It basically it tells us we become what we behold. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a master, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Isn't that interesting? So we become what we look at. So if we want to be like, let's just look at Jesus even more. Let me ask you to stand. I'm going to ask you to pray about a couple of things. One of, us, one of them is, is your lampstand. I felt like when I said earlier something about that, I felt like many of you were really processing that. What is my position in life? Am, am I using my lampstand? You see, if you, if you want to have a bigger lampstand, then use the one you have. Are you faithful to the people in your world to try to bring them to Him, bring them to the city where they can see Him, the church? Are you, are you shining a light where you can? I believe if you shine a light where you can, and many days you're going to feel like you're not doing too good, but you're doing what you can. I believe you'll find that God will give you a bigger lampstand. So let's pray about that. Would you just take a minute and pray with me? Pray about your lampstand. Am I being faithful with the lampstand you've given me, Lord? And is there something I can do to make it better, to make it bigger? Am I sharing your story? Am I sharing my story? Am I excited about sharing my story? 
Or is there still too much hesitation to tell my story? And maybe you need to invite God into your story. Maybe you need to quit trying to get your story right apart from Him. Maybe you need to keep Him not at the edges of your story, but put Him in the center of your story. And when you put God at the center of your story, here's how you know you've done that. You turn around, and all of a sudden, you're excited. You don't know how and when, but you know you're excited about sharing your story now. Because it's really now His story. It's not just your story anymore. How many of you, with every head bowed, would say, Pastor, I'm, I realize today that I need to put God at the center of my story just lift your hand. I want to pray for you. No one looking around. I just sense there's a lot of people here. This is where you are. God's not trying to call you out, but He's trying to help you. Get excited. He wants to give you a quality of life that's better than the one you have right now. Hold your hand up. Let me pray for you. I want Jesus, just tell Him, I want you at the center of my story. I want you, Lord, at the center of my story. Not at the edges. I'm, not, I'm tired of just trying to get it right. And Lord, I'm asking you to come into my story right now and be the Lord of my life. I give every part of this story, the bad chapters and the good chapters, the past chapters and the future chapters. I give every part, Lord, of this story to you. And I thank you. I ask you to use every person that's in this service today as bright lights. Starting now, not someday, but now. Let us be bright lights, Lord. Let us shine light where we can. And let us bring people to your city that they may see something about you they've never seen before. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. All right. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. Our team is coming. And we're here to pray with you. And we would love to do that if you need or desire prayer for any reason. God bless you. I'll see you next week.